I'm Ali Mohammed Mujani. I'm Executive Director of the Independent Schools Association of Southern Africa. And I'm, I did enjoy the debate, and I'm glad that actually the debate was not about polarities, about you know, public, either public or private, but actually about the complexities of the intertwined sections of, of the systems. And I think it's one system. But what I wanted to challenge David on is that there's far too much emphasis in South Africa, and I think there's a problem. The debate is always about matric results, about quintiles, and about comparing provinces amongst themselves. There's not enough debate about seriously making sure that all children are school ready. That is how you're going to solve quality education in South Africa. And I hope that the DG Murray Trust will do something about pre-primary education, because from zero to six, we know that's the most important time in terms of making sure there's quality education. But I think, secondly, what my criticism of David's point is, the department already has interventions in systems, and those provinces that work well in getting matric results do have cracker teams to go in and fix poor performing independent public schools. What are we going to do about making them far more efficient and more system wide? My name is uh, Siabonga Poezin. I'm a, a student here at uh, CPUT. Uh, of course, I'm an uh, agent of change. Uh, I think. Uh, Part among the things that I think we need to, to, to address here, and it's fundamental, it's important, is to first uh, 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 find the fundamental problem in our education system just before we move forward on anything. Uh, also, to check the purpose of education system that was brought to us uh, many years ago. I think those are the fundamental questions that we need to address for us to move forward. Yes, we all agree that education uh, is, is a key to socio-economic uh, development of society because obviously it, it unlocks the potential of the individuals in terms of you know, uh, human resource development and so on. But also, I think it's important to understand that, for an example, it allows us to, to read and, uh, and of course to, 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 to write and count, and that is necessary for, 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 for employment and for job creation and for economic growth. So those are the things that are very important. But uh, for us uh, to be provoked when we hear the word uh, privatization, in terms, in, especially in education, uh, what we need to understand is that uh, I think this is uh, mainly uh, uh, focused to uh, Dr. Fanti Merve. I think we must understand uh, uh, that we, we, we are in a position of ideological contestation, you know, uh, 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 between the state and, and, and the private sector. And that we must know. And we can't run away from that fact. And by that, we must understand that as well, uh, that of course, in terms of education, education on its own is a component in a state. So therefore, the state is the one that is responsible for any components within it. So, so the education is part of the state, and the state is the responsibility of the state to make sure that it funds the education, and that's it. Because, of course, if there is a contestation between the state and the private sector, and that means ideologically, and that means that in a state position, there is an agenda. And the agenda is one. Yeah, and yeah, yeah just, just before I go to the question, yeah. And the agenda is one in terms of the, uh, the, the state, is the agenda of transformation. And we want to understand from the private side, uh, what is it that are you bringing forward in terms of transform? Because the agenda is one, is to redress the ills of the past. So are you in that also, are you in that position of, of, of bringing uh, out the transformation? And if, that, and if it's that, then we agree. If it's not, we don't. We will remain the agents of change. Thank you very much. Please, can you please keep it short, precise, the question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Renee McFollin. I work as a researcher for Equal Education. And my question is also to David Harrison. Uh, I'd like to know from you, you've talked about a certain model of collaboration schools that involves nonprofit uh, school operators that doesn't cherry pick learners, so it doesn't have selection processes. But if you compare that kind of model to the legislation proposed by the Western Cape government, there are no guarantees in that legislation that those principles will actually be part of the final official model. So my question is to you, if you think, if you say that you will withdraw from this project if it becomes, if it allows for for-profit uh, participants, 
Is the DJ Murray Trust doing anything to lobby government to ensure that they do put in measures that ensure that uh, for-profit partners aren't allowed to get involved in this uh, project? I don't think it's good enough to say, well, the Western Cape government can do what it wants with this model. Um, and then my second question is based on Heather's critique, if you can maybe uh, explain to us in terms of the uh, theory of change, why it's necessary for these partners to have a majority representation on school governing bodies rather than just uh, some representation or assisting schools on school level. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. My name is Jonathan Rastan. I'm the provincial secretary of Sato uh, in the province. I have, I have uh, a lot to say, but we uh, pretty much by saying that uh, we believe that education is for the public good and it's the responsibility of the state and no one else to provide education as a, as a premise. Let me ask my first question to David, because I think the hot topic is collaboration schools in the Western Cape. What is your legal framework for being able to establish collaboration schools in the province in terms of either the Schools Act or in terms of the Western Cape Schools Amendment Act? Not the bill that's been published. Secondly, what is your, your uh, posture on uh, collaboration schools undermining uh, collective bargaining process in the, in the country? And thirdly, I want to ask, what, it, what is your view on having two sets of employees, because some of the schools have state employees and other have employees um, by the SGBs. Just one question with another chair to the to, uh, Kiro schools. What is your posture on the PIC using the surplus funds of government workers, the working class, to actually fund a private profit-making entity? I must say that we find it completely unacceptable that our surplus of a pension fund is used to enrich stakeholders and, stake and, and shareholders. Thank you. Uh, my name is Simpua George, the Provincial Secretary of SASCO, South African Student Congress. Uh, look, uh, surely uh, most people know that uh, uh, in 2015, uh, in 2016, students were out in the street fighting for free education and also for insourcing in, uh, in higher institutions. And therefore, the question of privatization, surely by me speaking, representing such an organization, you know it's out. Because it represents, as a comrade, uh, oh, Mr. Dr. Uh, Motale, Mr. Motale has said that it is an ideological question uh, that has, it's historic as well. So I'm saying, Anything that has to do, to do has to ensure that at least it uh, 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 comes up with the transformative agenda of the South African government. And I want to actually uh, 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 agree with the agenda of reconstruction, transformation, and uh, uh, ensuring that we have a united uh, South Africa. And that in its uh, 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 iota is a trans it's an in uh, phasing out the inequality, ensuring that the gap between the rich and the poor comes, and education then plays a pivotal role to ensure that it uh, actually expands and enlightens uh, those who are coming from the poor background, uh, uh, from the poor background, you understand? Because we have agreed here that uh, poor schools produces, uh, there, are more, there are a lot of future students who went to poor, uh, 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 poor schools, poor facilities, who dropped out, who, does, who do not do, uh, uh, good. That then highlights the inequality uh, uh, that we see in our society. And my question now begins to say that uh, in your first, uh, your, 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 your Kuro uh, schooling, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Dr. Van der Merve, uh, does that uh, uh, schooling that you run seek to address the inequalities and uh, seek to close the division within society that we see? And uh, also, um, uh, uh, Dr. David, the collaboration schooling, does that uh, collaborating ensure that it seeks to address these inequalities that we see in our society? And uh, does, uh, do you at least have an understanding that the education itself is supposed to be delivered by government because it's for public uh, uh, good and therefore the state should 
uh, actually PE that is in charge of ensuring that it gives the education because in education there's the curriculum uh, part of it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sanju. Uh, the speakers should do is that there's been missed some questions that have been directed to specific speakers like Chris, like David, like uh, uh, Mr. M like Hida. So what I think we should do, for example, Chris, you have your questions. Perhaps you address them and uh, you do that as well, David, all of us in that, in that way. Thank you. that three questions was, was, was asked. Is the sound okay? Am I speaking loud enough? Like so? Yeah. Right. The first question, sir, came from you about transformation. Yes. Uh, I can confirm on behalf of the company that we are absolutely dedicated to transformation. Uh, a year and a half ago, we set up a transformation a committee under the auspices of Tabisu Ramasiki, a very knowledgeable change agent that helped the banks to transform. We seek a specialist that could help us with that. And since then, we have formulated a transformation charter, which at the right moment when we feel we are ready with it, will share with all schools, all groups of schools uh, that can use this charter to enhance transformation. So absolutely dedicated to that one. We also appointed a chap called Pakamiza Nzamele. I don't know whether you know Pakamiza, but he was a very prominent journalist at the Sunday Times. Uh, in the post description, strategic relationships to literally engage with as many as possible stakeholders to see how Kiro can come closer to community and the community's needs. I am for not one moment saying, sir, that we are already there, but we have made a lot of progress. So I can confirm our heartbeat is right. Then, sir, um, you asked about the PIC. Now, we had several engagements with Dr. Dan, and uh, the PIC obviously seeks for investments that can enlarge their funds to ultimately uh, benefit the pension fund so that those mu that must in future draw money from the pension fund um, will get maximum benefit. So I think the way Dr. Dan sees the private sector is to say, well, uh, we've got a growth company here, uh, it's a good investment case, and the PIC on behalf of the pension fund can grow. So that's Dr. Dan's orientation towards this one. Then a third question came about inequality. Just help me, uh, who, uh, um, somebody asked about inequality. Third question? Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, I, I have been listening quite diligently to the speakers. And I must say, Prof, I'm, I'm finding this, this is a good thing, even though that we have differences. You know, as a teacher, I bet for a child. And if we can get a system where no child is deprived from a good village of education, meaning that that child can become what the child can become, then I think that is the solution. So in terms of inequality, you know what I missed this afternoon is we are focusing in terms of criticism on private, uh, the private school sector, and that's good, the debate should go on. But folks, as an educationalist, I think we are all in agreement that the general quality of basic school education in the country can be much better. Really, I think that's consensus. Now, the private sector currently only covers for 6% of the 12.5 million children. 
600,000 children of 12 and a half million children goes to private schools. So we need to look beyond the corridors of only private schools to fix up the general quality in education. So let me answer the question about inequality. Once again, we are trying our best. We set up the Rutha Sechaba Trust Fund to make it possible that children that couldn't get the advantage of going to a private school or to a, 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 a top school can be benefited. And the Rutha Sechaba Trust Fund is gaining a lot of momentum. We also engaged with the Titans cricket team to identify a couple of young black stars. And sir, you must see them. It's incredible cricketers, but the problem with the Titans was they picked a child here and one there and one here and there, but the children came from various schools, various qualities. So they approached us and they asked us, can't Kiro be responsible to provide the education to these future proteas whilst the Titans take care of the professional coaching? But we pay for it. So I am extremely, extremely positive about the Ruth Asachaba Trust Fund. Our um, senior investor, PSG, and Prof, you asked what PSG stands for. It's an acronym. It's an investment company, uh, PSG. Um, they also have a Diplio um, fund that's quite strong in terms of millions of rands. And when that company, in terms of its return vests, the money will plough back into making it possible to help out uh, many, many children. In conclusion, folks, we can only do so much. That's why in my argument I said, I think the lady here asked the question about this, this one school that's battling and then the private sector helping the school so that both can, can shine. You know, ma'am, if, if we make profit, it surely should be part of our DNA to give back to the, to the country. Now, my argument is, at a certain stage, because Kiro is not yet a matured company, only six years listed on the JSE, but let's say when this company becomes mature and we can sit down with an MEC and say, we can help this school in this community in terms of jacking up its facilities, you know, ma'am, I've been driving along in my car and I saw schools that don't even have toilets and, and, and. Now, my argument, if we can make this a beautiful school on our cost, even if it's only one school, the average size of a school is 1,500 kids, then we helped 1,500 kids. So I understand the criticism because this thing called money and education, you know, it kind of create conflict. But, folks, the reality is... Um, there's not enough schools in the country. And if the state doesn't build enough schools, then the private sector wants to stand up and say, we will get money from the shareholders and we will build more and more good schools. So, okay, Prof, that's the three questions. Okay. Five questions for me, so it's gonna be sound bites. First question, um, the power of the first the first few years of life, absolutely. That's what's going to be ultimately truly transformational. Um, what's DG Murray Trust doing about it? That's where 75, 80% of our money is invested. Uh, zero stunting, trying to promote early learning through Smart Start, through Nali Bali, uh, through working with Treasury to free up now 2 billion rand extra for early childhood development. This is where we should be investing most of our energy. So I, I'm, I'm completely with you. That's where the power lies. Uh, the question around, around commercialization for, I, 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 have to, I have to throw the question back at you. I mean, we're working in the poorest 40% of schools. Which commercial operator who wants to make a profit is going to go there? And, and no, no, I think, I, you know, within the schooling system. So, so clearly, we, clearly what we're trying to do is define with the department, define with the department um, what collaboration schools are. Non-profit, non-selective, non-fee-paying schools. That's, that's our position. 
And, and, and yes, I mean, of course, we're engaging with the, with the department in terms of, uh, in terms of their draft le legislation to ensure that the integrity of the concept and the ideas is, is, is held. Questions around um, collective bargaining. Well, I mean, the Constitution uh, guarantees the rights of trade unions in any school, public or private. So I'm not sure what, what, that, question, uh, what that question means. Legal, the legal uh, positioning of the school. Um, in terms of the National Education Collaboration Trust, space has been created for innovation in the sector. Um, clearly, it's got to be with, with the um, permission of parents to innovate in a school. And so once again, I say, parents are the one that invites, uh, invite collaboration schools in. Parents are the ones who kick them out. It's parents who decide. Um, and, and um, you know, uh, it, when we started, yes, we, we thought that, that, that the school operating partners needed a majority say, because how else? Um, could the, the, the uh, school operating partners truly be held accountable to the department? As we engaged in the tough schools, in uh, Langa, in, uh, in Imizamo Yetu, um, uh, it, it became clear that that was not desirable to have a majority. Um, and so we were willing to back down from that. Do you know what the parents wanted? Nothing less than 50-50. The parents wanted it because if they said we were, if 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 the school operating partner was 20 or 30 percent, how would they be able to hold the school operating partner to to account for what happened in the school? So I think sometimes we must be careful that we don't speak on behalf of parents, and that's an, a key part of what this initiative is about: is to try and ensure that there's a process of empowering parents, perhaps in a different way, from. Uh, from, from simply regist uh, um, representation on a school governing body. Thank you. from Science Education UWC. Professor Syed, uh, you talked about the achievement advantage of private and public schools. So my question is, what is the success rate of private versus public school students at tertiary level? And also, Dr. Van Merwe, you said that you are planning a tertiary institute uh, of the Kuro schools. Since there is already a divide on the school level, so won't this just create a further divide in terms of private versus pr um, public education? And Mr. Motala, I would like your viewpoint on the establishment of private tertiary institutes. Yes, as such as the Cura schools. Thank you. Hi, good day. My name is Garth Shaw. Um, I'd like to ask a question. My question applies both to, to Dr. Chris and Dr. David, and, and it draws on something that Dr. Heather was talking about, about um, downward pressure and accountability as opposed to horizontal support and accountability. And, 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 and the question is really about how shareholders can provide guidance or how private entities can provide guidance to schools in backing circumstances. Um, I, think, I, think, I think typically both of those parties are going to be coming from totally different sectors of society. Um, and there's a, I mean, there's a very interesting case of, of, of school support that's happened here in Cape Town where a school provided support to another school over a sustained period. And one of the major criticisms of that, of that support was that, was that that school wasn't grounded in the same socioeconomic context and wasn't able to provide support um, at, the, at the point of need. And, and I'm just really battling to see how, how shareholders um, from the upper echelons of society and, 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 and private enterprises can provide that kind of support at ground level as needed by battling schools. Thank you. My question is posed to Dr. Harrison on collaboration schools with reference to the casualization of labor in those schools. What is your take, Dr. Harrison, with regards to the erosion of workers' rights? Because 
we all know that every worker seeks job, se job security. And you sit with this collaboration school, you end up with two sets of uh, teachers, those who are employed by the, by the uh, by, by government, who are, who are permanent, and those teachers who will always be on contract. Because this is not just, it, it's a complex issue, because there are benefits that are tied together with the status of the employee in that type of a school. What is your take on that? Because we think that it's, it, it, it flies against the provisions, for instance, in the LRA, where the employers have fought for against, I mean, the employees have fought against casualization. And what the collaboration schools are really for is this casualization you are fighting. I'm Ashley, and I'm from an organization called Bottom Up. Um, my interest, well, my question rather is to David from the DG Mari Trust, and I'm just uh, looking at one of the slides that you presented. Is why do poor schools produce poor results? And some of the things listed here are language and cognitive factors. Poor schools lack the extent and the diversity of social capital, or school level cultures of teacher development, etc. And I guess I'm, I'm kind of echoing a bit of what Heather said in terms of the approach or the response here and saying that we're locating this within a school improvement model and saying, okay, so these are the ways and things. What work is DG Murray actually doing in terms of locating these issues that you've seen here within the context itself? Um, why are these problems here? As we're talking about the historical context of South Africa. We're talking about distribution of resources, um, the way in which schools are positioned. What work is being done to actually analyze and study those problems um, as they are particularly to each school, um, rather than just saying, oh, poor schools, we need to give extra reading, we need to do extra maths, or we need to skill up teachers without looking at what are the specifics within each of those schools. Um. My name is Mtutuzel Zingano. I'm doing a fourth year here in Mob Campus Education. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I'm sure it's clear to all of us that uh, in order to provide quality education, uh, government, society, uh, in the case of parents and the private sector, need to play a, a, a role in making sure that uh, South African learners receive quality education. But my question to, to, to all the panelists there is that, how do we make sure that we produce, uh, we, 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 we deliver this quality education, even though we know that this quality education, I must, I must, I must say, who, who benefits from this quality education? When this quality education, when this education system is colonized, because at the core of the problem, we, we've got a problem of language. The reason why many students drop out is because the medium of instruction is not in the favor of the poor, and the poor in our case will always be the Africans, the blacks. So, how do we make sure in in both private and collaborating schools? How do we make sure that we provide quality education, whereas we have this problem that many people run away from, of language? Thanks very much. Okay, there's just someone crying here. Crying, is there a crying question to face? Can we allow him for short? That's a short question. And we stop. Yeah. Hi, sorry. My name is uh, Khotatsu Meka from All Mutuals Investment Fund, which has a substantially large investment with, uh, with Kuro. Um, well, just let's maybe talk. Um, yeah, my question um, is in terms of, I think a lot of people have asked about transformation, etc., which I didn't quite get the context. But in my context, um, you know, there's commercial and there's the actual schooling. From a commercial perspective, um, what are you doing in terms of transformation at, you know, at sort of shareholder level and at upper um, management level? 
because the only people that I've ever interacted with Kuro um, are all, you know, mainly male and pale. And then just quickly to answer one of the questions here about the privatization and uh, who does it benefit, etc. I think, as Chris has as correctly mentioned, we, private schools only make up 5% of, well, 5% 5, 5 of, um, of all schooling. The government, instead of being criticizing um, the private sector, you, the government controls the majority of the education. They've got masses and masses of uh, budgets. You know, we've got one of the highest proportions of our budget going towards education. More money being thrown to the problem by the wrong operators is not going to solve that problem. And one thing that Chris has also said was not that the government is doing a bad job, but that they can work together. And we have tried to work with the government. Some successes, but a lot of resistance. Thank you very much, Khotetso. Uh, I think uh, each and every, uh, 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 each one of you has a question. And then can we start with Chris and then we go this way. Okay. Uh, shall I start with Old Mutual? <laughs> Sir, thank you for investing in us. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, um, I think your question is spot on. So, let me confirm the principle that we are absolutely open for any BEE uh, transaction. Over the years, over the years, we were literally approached by many different groups. The other day, I had three lovely gentlemen from Gauteng um, that. Uh, brought a couple of families together with a particular amount. Obviously, I must protect um, uh, their names and so on. But we are looking at it. Then, as you know, we are a listed company. We've got 21,000 shareholders sir, globally. It is a public traded um, entity, so anyone can, can buy shares. Then what also happens from time to time and it varies from our AGMs to AGMs, but typically the chairperson of the company will ask the approval of a re resolution to have 10% of your shares under your own management. So there's many, many ways um, to actually enhance uh, transformation at uh, shareholder level. Bear in mind, uh, as you know, a listed company gets a shareholder register, um, uh, from board meeting to board meeting and obviously for us to scrutinize 22,000 shareholders and to actually come to the conclusion what the kind of profile is is extremely difficult. So let's address the principle. Absolutely open for any person, individual or entity that approach us with something uh, uh, like you suggested. I know Yanni Maton and Piet Maton is also absolutely open for something 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 like that. Um, Prof Wallen here, yeah, can I just answer the other questions as well? Oh management level, yes. So our board, our board is one hundred percent representative. Shall I name the names quickly for the audience? So it's hundred percent uh, representative um, uh, and 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 while I have the audience here, um, gee folks um, yeah, I can confirm it. You, it's a public company. You can go check it out, our board. At, at Exco level, we are moving very aggressively. Remember, I made mention of the transformation charter. So we are dedicated. Then you must just help me. Um, also, sir, 40% of our total staff, uh, um, now remember, all of them are not teachers, are black folks. Now, let me admit, I sat with Panyaza Lasufi in his office and I said, sir, if we were to go headhunt all the great teachers in the state sector, then I'm not showing my, my bona fides and I'm not helping the state because we are promoting that we want to work adjacent with the state. So we have a program in terms of appointing, uh, uh, enhancing transformation. It's going according to plan, but we would like to enhance it. 
faster and faster. The nice thing is that our students from our tertiary institutes that apply for our post, the youngsters, are like 100% the profile of the country. And we, we adore that. Uh, sir, somebody had a question about, uh, sir, I think it was you, the general challenge in education. I'm going to make it very brief. So, very brief, Prof. I'm a curriculum developer. I've worked with many state schools because we have conferences where we invite Prof. all the state school teachers in our vicinity to, to come collaborate with us. And we, we learn from them and later they learn. It's a collaboration. But I'm going to make three sounds. Quality lies in school management and in the subject knowledge of the teachers that's standing in front of your kid. My humble opinion is that the unions must play a role in upping the skill sets of teachers. We will play our role, but obviously the, the, the state also have their mechanisms. Uh, somebody asked me about the tertiary lady, I think it was you. So our argument is this, same as in Kiro. Lady, we are small. There's 26 public universities in the country catering for a million students. According to our research, uh, especially the popular degrees. There's, there's not place for all our kids uh, to actually be admitted to the universities. So, so the admission policies is so strict that for some of these qualifications, you literally need 75 to 85% to be, to be allowed. Not even mentioning the dilemma in the med medical schools where you need more than, more than uh, you know, uh, 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 90%. So I, according to our statistics, 50,000 students, folks, 50,000 grade 12s per annum can't get access for the degrees at the universities that they would like to attend. Now, remember, a tertiary institute over the years is partially state-funded, so parents always have to contribute. What I didn't tell you is Kiro stands for affordable education. Now, I know it's not cheap, so you can criticize me there, but we, we promote affordable. So same in tertiary. If we could put a product on the table that makes it inviting for the 50,000 students that don't get placement. Lady, I was a 65 percenter in matric and I didn't turn out too shabby. So people mustn't tell me that if you get a 65 with a difficult uh, uh, su subjects that you can't make it. If there's care taken by the lecturers, lady, then we can, we can push those children through. Okay, last but not, last but not least, Prof, one more question. Um, oh yes, colonialism. It was somebody, somebody here. Yeah? Yes, um, folks. Uh, just give, give me, just give me a half a minute. We can't gamble with this country. This is a great country. I am a positive SA citizen. Um, the future of the country is in the hands of our youth. Now, we've got to create top pilots, top medical students, top teachers, top CAs, top this, top that. We mustn't stand back for the world, folks. So, so in terms of the debate, I guess we must seek for a mid-path to accommodate the country's cultural heritage and the needs, the needs in terms of academic excellence. And the answer, Prof, is in the balance. Thank you. I think you're just feeling sorry for me for the, that I didn't have uh, any questions to answer. But thank you nonetheless, because it gives me an opportunity to say, I want to make two points in response to what you're saying, because you, I think you heard what my general orientation to privatization is. But because it's so general, it doesn't, act, you know, you have to drill down to understand the implications of what I'm saying. The first implication is this. <clears throat> Of course, there has been private forms of education historically for a long time. The aristocracies, of Europe in particular, had their own forms of private education. Eh? The upper classes in the 
uh, emerging democracies, even to this day, you know, they have their own forms of private education. They've had that, there's homeschooling, which in some ways is also a form of private education. So what's the complaint that I'm making? I'm making that there is a sea change which is taking place, which is as a consequence of the crisis of the forms of capital accumulation globally, which requires capital to adopt a new strategy. And its new strategy is fundamentally to seek greater levels of profitability through the use of the public fiscus. Because until now, it has not been able to get its hands into the public purse. So examine, for instance, the Lesotho National Hospital. And of course, there are these powerful global policy institutions which insist that if they give you a loan, like the Lesotho National Hospital, for a public-private partnership, they will give it to you only on that condition. And the people of Lesotho will have to pay back that loan. By the way, the loan is not free. No IMF structural loan is free. In fact, it is at a rate which generally sets the rate of lending of the national banks of each and every country, which, by the way, I privatized. So I hope you understand the implications of this. We are in a historical stage epoch of capital accumulation which is based on the predation, that's the only word I can use, the predation of public resources. That's the main fundamental systemic structural and historical difference. If you don't understand that, you won't understand what the implications of privatization are and where the world is going. Now if you look at the world, there are billions. The state of Hyderabad is virtually, totally taken over by these public-private partnerships in schooling. I'm talking of schooling only. You know, if I, if I start setting out, read Di Muzio, and if I start setting out what exactly these PPPs are beginning to do globally to public resources, you know, your eyeballs will pop out. As I said, 71 trillion rands they want to grab hold of over the next few years. If you, if you, if you look at uh, uh, the US, this is this prime example of great democracy. I talked about India, which is you know, the biggest democracy in the world. That's what it's doing. The US, the prime, subprime crisis. Obama came out screaming, I'm going to hang a few, you know, what they eventually, what did they do? They bailed them out with more public resources. And that's why the citizens of America have turned rightward, because they have no confidence in a government which has sold them down the drain. And unfortunately, they choose, like the workers in Germany, fascist or proto-fascist solutions, thinking that it'll get them out of a mess. And they are making a fundamental mistake because that is a warmongering state which will drive the people of the US into more wars. The second point I want to make is simply this, that the state, my dear colleague, comrade from Sasko, the fundamental contradiction is no longer between the state and capital. Because the state has abandoned, and I'm talking of the major states of the world, have abandoned their democratic mandate in favor of becoming subservient. The example of the PIC and Old Mutual, for three, about 400 million rands from Old Mutual and the PIC's funds in support of private education in this country is a minuscule, it's a small example. States all over the world are compromising their democratic mandate by pouring money at the behest of global corporate, deregulating the things that prevent corporate raiders from destroying the environment, destroying public life, destroying our democratic responsibilities. Ask the people from equal education whether there is enough money in this country to meet the basic infrastructural requirements of public schooling at the lowest level. Ask them. 
They've done all the detail, the, the work on it. The truth of the matter is that the state, the state has, has agreed to the austerity measures. Are you with me? Did somebody say, heard, I heard somebody say, well, you know, we throw money at so and so. Well, please go look at those schools and see how much money is thrown there. It's really a complete misconception. It's a complete misconception. And we have to understand that the role of the state is being every day vitiated by the power of capital. Look, I think the idea behind the symposium was to have scholarly discussion. I share Anvis' sentiment, and I share the sentiment of the audience, but the devil is in the detail, right? In India, just one fact, in every well-functioning government schools, in the states that have well-functioning government schools, the number of students in private schools and universities declined in a year. So when we talk about the state versus capital, it's the same state that have put in place semi-private public schools since 1997. And that's why I agree with, with David. He takes a lot of heat. But the argument is this is the state that put in place. This is also the same state that has a BE preferential policy, which allows corporate investment in education and in private education to get preferential procurement contracts. So when we talk about this, the same state that puts PIC money, so when we talk about the state, we need to know who the state is. And I think the state is not the benign, benevolent government we think it is. And for me, that's the polarity we need to shift. The blurring of the boundaries is between the state and the, the public and private and the changing composition of the state, which is what I was saying in the paper, Yusuf. It's about the state separating out, which David picked up on, separating out responsibility and provisioning. That is a fundamental conceptual shift, and that's where I differ with David, not the other things. It's around that fundamental shift they're making, whether it's the right thing. And then fundamentally where I differ with David, I think, is whether you think the X model C option or the quintile five option is the one that can be generalized to 80% of the schools. And that's where we differ as well. And I think it's those debates I think if we need to walk away from to see the state not as benign, but as a subject of contestation with capital in the state, not outside the state. And I think that's the polarity we need to move beyond because we've had semi-private schools since 1996 or 1997. Thank you. Sure. So, I think I'm the last. Hey. Um, so, so I have to agree with Enver that um, the world is at a crossroads. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting crossroads if you've read Piketty's book because now, at this point in history, um, the entire public wealth has been transferred into private hands. If you look at, if you look at the, the public debt, where is the private sector going to suck from next? Um, I think we need to be honest and, 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 and say there's no way that, the, that this global system is sustainable. Something is going to give. Um, and, and the notion that there is simply insatiable money that, that the private sector can suck out of the public sector is simply not true. There ain't money there. Where is it going to come from? How are we going to align the system? So I think we need to get beyond these ideological, ideologically polarized debates and face this crisis um, together that the, that the world and the country is facing. In terms of accountability, look, we don't have all the answers. What, what we know is that what we're trying to ensure in the collaboration schools is that, is, is that the child is at the center, that any sort of learner appraisal benefits the individual child first, benefits the school learners collectively, 
um, is directed into a, a process of individual teacher development, uh, is then directed back to the parents um, so that parents can participate in their children's education, is then directed to the circuit and the district does not bypass them, and, and, and then to the province. Clearly there has to be an agreement that we have with the province, but we're trying to create a, a bottom-up type of accountability. Will we get it right? Heather, I'd love you to come out to the schools, see how we're doing it, and see if there's a better way um, of achieving that. Workers' rights, and, and let's just be clear, workers' rights in South Africa must apply to the private sector as much as, as the public sector. Um, what we've tried to ensure is that there's a state guarantee of post-provisioning both the salaries and the benefits, the same equivalent, um, gets, transferred to, uh, got, gets transferred to the school. Um, um, people who are on, the state, uh, on state employment and who wants to stay on state employment, they can do that. If they want to change to an SGP post, they can do that. New, new uh, employees into the school uh, need to come onto the SGP post. We opened um, two new schools. Usually, there are about 100, 150 applications for teacher positions at new schools. There were 1,600 applications from teachers wanting to go into the SGB post. I hear what you're saying about casualization, but, but we also need to understand that the, the demand is not only coming from, uh, 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 that the demand is, is coming from teachers um, as much as it is from, from anyone else. Poor results in poor schools? Yes, of course, and it comes back. And I think the point that was made, the most fundamental point from the first speaker was glossed over as, uh, as we once again focus in on schools. Um, the power of the first few years of life is what's going to be truly re redistributive, truly transformation in South Africa. There is no shortcut. Stunting rates in South Africa are just as they were 40 years ago. One quarter of our children receive any sort of quality, uh, quality early learning. Um, mother tongue education and, and early language development is not in place. Um, the biggest travesty that I think our, our children face, and thank you for the person for raising it, is the, fa is, the, is the abrupt transition from English in grade four. That is a massive identity crisis for children. And we, we've got to address it. And these are the type of debates that we're talking about in collaboration schools uh, as, to, as, as to how we achieve that. Um, a final comment, um, how are we articulating with the system and how are we seeking to, to, to look at the broader system? We've got, to, we've got to help look at where money is being spent in the system, how much money is being spent at the school level, at the learner level, how much money has been directed for administration. So, so we're working with the department to have a sort of budget analysis that answers those sort of questions. In some of the districts of this country, there are 200 people in a district office, 200. And you know how much they're getting paid in the district office compared to teachers. Um, and also, this process is seeking to clarify in a model where you have a, a, a devolved system of, of, of a network that accounts to the, accounts to the district. What, what type of support does one still require from, uh, from, uh, from the district to ensure that collaboration schools are fundamentally part of the public system? Thank you very much.